Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the always wonderful Mara Tierney to talk all about her Showtime series, American Rust. And I wanted to start by talking about that early email that Jeff Daniels sent you once you were cast in the show, where he was basically saying, you know, congratulations, like, welcome to the show. I'm here to talk about character and backstory and all those details if you want to, but also if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, and I love the fact that both of you are actors who your process very much sounds like it's about doing the homework and doing the research and then coming to set so you can throw it away, but not necessarily needing to dive into all of those conversations with one another other ahead of time and you know given that that was how the two of you decided to work on this show was interested in how that then infiltrated in the dynamic amongst the entire cast because there's this really great ensemble you've got Alex who's playing your son and was it really across the board with everybody that it was less about conversation and more about finding the moment on camera once you were on set together hmm. I you know it's a big ensemble cast and a great cast I worked with Jeff and Alex and Mark so I can't really speak to what went down with like I, the the kids, you know. But um, so it's a, it was it's very interesting because it it is like I said, big ensemble cast, and I didn't even see them because it was COVID. So it was it was sort of like Jeff and I. Most of my work is with Jeff and Alex, and we were the working in vacuums you know, either with, with either one of them and then occasionally Mark. So who's wonderful, but it was so because COVID, which is, I'm very grateful to have worked, but there's so many restrictions. Um, there was not an opportunity to watch other people work or see how they work. Like we had to just get out when we were done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And is it right that this was one of the productions that started and then had to shut down for a little bit in the middle? We middle? didn't shut down. I, I okay. mean, I, I, we were very fortunate that way, but we were very st strict. I mean, yeah, you know, we were tested three times a week, sometimes five times a week. You know, that it was, and I think all of us were very well behaved too. A couple of people got COVID, not in the cast, but we didn't have to shut down. Yeah, that's really wonderful because mm -hmm. I know it's 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 a hard achievement. Um, and going back to that idea of, of the homework and the research that you like to do before a role beyond the scripts, I know that you, you've spoken about how for you reading the original source material of the book didn't feel like it was the right fit for you and it was very much about focusing on the scripts. And so then beyond the details that the scripts gave you, what was that that research and that homework for this particular character for you? Um, I think I sometimes read the book, you know, when, when I, I did a movie called Primary Colors like a bazillion years ago and I, I read the book, you know, that was, and uh, it was extremely helpful. With this, I felt that American Rust itself is a novel that I think is very much written in sort of interior monologues of the characters. And I knew that they were changing Grace and I didn't want the writer's interior monologue of his Grace and floating around my head. I wanted to, you know, have my choices. So um, maybe I could read it now because people, as you know, people really love the book. Um, research, um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't do so much research on this character. Um, I read about the, the opioid crisis um, but I think being there was the most effective, um, being shooting in these towns in Pittsburgh, <clears throat> which are decimated, you know, between these two things of the factories shutting down and the mills shutting down and the opioid crisis. It's just, it's really heartbreaking to see that these people were like left, just left the companies left and then there was no support system and these towns are broken and nothing is open all the stores are closed it's it feels so um tragic so that was very impactful impactful for me being there um that kind of sinks into you when you're in these environments and i and and so that i think would have a lot of effect on my performance 
Yeah. And you're playing a character who has, you know, she's done everything by the book her entire life and has a really extraordinary work ethic. And it's almost because she's been doing all these things by the book that that everything's been working against her, um, you know, from the work that she does where she's incredibly judicious, but now she's got incredible pain that she's trying to manage on a daily basis. Um, you know, the lack of opportunities that there are as well within that community. Um, and obviously we see that journey gradually building throughout the show where she starts to kind of step back and look at, well, if, if I've already do, always done everything by the book and it hasn't worked, maybe I need to try and do things differently. And so how did you want to approach that gradual shift in her as a character where she starts to go through that journey and that process with herself? Um, I, I think it is, it's true that I think, you know, there's, because I am my age, there's a certain point and you go, how did I get here? Like, how did I get here? You know, I have done everything right. I've tried to do everything right. I mean, she did one wrong thing, which is pick the wrong guy to have a baby with. But that's a really unfortunate mistake that she's been having, having to live with for 23 years. So um, I think it was a lot on the page. I think it's the storytelling in this show is kind of like a slow burn, I think. And so I tried to monitor it via pr performance. And I think Danny and Adam too, we tried to um, plausibly portray someone who, like you said, always played by the rules and what will drive them to do things that are not at all according to the rules. You know, will she seduce and pretend to love a man to help her son? Will she? Will, how far will she go? And I think it was, you know, like a meeting of between, you know, the performance and the writing to try to illustrate that. Mm -hmm. And with that emotional tracking as well, you weren't block shooting, you were shooting scenes from episode one, episode five, and really jumping back and forth between episodes throughout the entire production. Um, and so what's kind of your process for making sure that when you're offset, you're, you're kind of coming in ready each day in production and you know exactly what the emotional tracking is so that there is that linearity once we're watching these episodes. It was very challenging for me. Um, it, it was super challenging. I relied on the script supervisor a lot too, but like that, so that, you know, your preparation becomes not just the preparation that the work or for the work you're doing tomorrow, the preparation also includes what was that work I did two Fridays ago. And then the scene after this is going to be, on Monday, so or, or the scene before this is going to be on Monday and the scene after this I shot two weeks ago. So there you had to, I had to kind of continually refresh myself. Um, you know, that was just part of, of the prep. And also you need, I need, and I don't know if it's a generational thing, but I need a hard copy to do that. Like on my computer, I need to look at the scene, this scene and that scene and that scene, as opposed to just clicking the page. For me, that doesn't, uh, it was much harder. So I had like stacks of, of nine scripts that I would have to constantly be, you know, referring to. Yeah. But that was, and, and that was challenging. I've never done anything as street, we, extreme as that. We, on the second day, Jeff had to shoot a two page monologue from episode nine. That's hard. How does he know where he's going to be? But challenging, challenge is, is good. Yeah. And and jumping into your character's relationship with Jeff's character, Del, um, I know that you've kind of mentioned that one of the balances that was a challenge to try and strike with that is she's coming at this relationship for different reasons at different times. And there's times where it does come from a place of, of genuine emotion and genuine love and they have this history together. And then there are moments where it is about that protective instinct that she has for her son and, and a real necessity and survivalism. But at the same time, it has to come across as genuine no matter the motives, because he's obviously, you know, he's an intelligent character and if it's too obvious, he's gonna spot it. And so how did you strike that balance of finding the slightly different aspects within your performance without it being something that would be too much of a tell for Dell as a character? Yeah, I was. that was also challenging um, because, you know what was actually very interesting about that is because we were shooting, I would say there's like four scenes that hinge on that. And I, I actually also believe two things can be true. I think you can love someone and also use them. For your, I, I mean, I think two things can be true and 
or at least someone can tell themselves that. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. But because we were shooting so out of order, I would say there's like four scenes that kind of, you know, the, the initiate this and then she makes some choices and she makes some other choice. Like it was about four or five scenes and we shot out of order. And so I think what happened was that shift we were looking for occurred when we shot it because that was the dynamics of the scene. And Jeff and I just fell into this groove that I felt was really powerful. And, and it, it was kind of too soon. It wasn't too soon. I'm saying as per the script, this moment was supposed to happen in this scene, but it didn't. That moment happened in an earlier scene because, because it did. And so then we had to address that issue because, you know, and not just repeat the beat in the, in the next episode. And so it's trying to find a way to, you know, not to somehow go deeper or um, just add something. But I'm, and I'm, I hope I'm making myself clear because it might be confusing. But as scripted, it was supposed to happen a certain way and performance it happened in a different way, which I, I think will be really good. Yeah, and it's interesting to watch some of the the small parallels between the two relationships that she has, both with Dell and with Virgil, because there is a little bit of, you know, on again, off again with both of them and the idea of kind of falling back into familiar habits and, and spaces that feel safe. And did you feel that part of that was a genesis of her being someone who has never really had people who are there to take care of herself and she is still trying to figure out her own skill set of like how to allow herself to be loved in the right way, but also to create that dynamic with a partner in the right way as well. Yeah, I agreed. I, I completely, that's very, it's exactly what I think. <laughs> but I, at the end of the, towards the end, which might've been late for me to figure this out, but I was like, oh, I don't know if anyone's ever loved her. You know, I think she's been taking care of herself for a long, long time and her son loves her, but I don't know. I felt quite, I thought it was sort of poignant because if you don't, if you haven't been loved, you don't know how to love properly. And I don't think she knows how to trust very well because of Virgil. Um, so I think she's navigating, it's dangerous for her, you know, romantic relationships. I also think Virgil's, you know, hilarious. I was speaking to someone the other day who called him a delightful fuck up, which is so true. And Mark's amazing, the actor, and he's funny. And so I, Grace is like so bummed out all the time. Do you know, there's nothing, she's not having a whole lot of fun. And I could see the pull just to like have a good time for a couple of hours, you know, even though you know he's bad news. So I, I think, I think that's a significant portion of it uh, for her. Yeah, she's shouldering so much. And then she also carries a lot herself as well. And and really, you know, at least in the first few episodes, the only times where we've really seen her let loose a little bit is with Virgil, where she kind of gets pulled back in by that charisma. And then the moment where she goes out bowling with her colleague, and even at the beginning, she's trying to talk about creating a union. Yeah. It has to be told like, you know, we're out here trying to have fun, like we're bowling. Um, right. And when you had scenes like that, how did you want to really find what is the side of her and what is the version of her that's able to let go of these things, even if it is just for a couple of hours? I don't know if she can. <laughs> I mean, I think it did happen with Virgil, but and certainly what we shot, things just get tougher. You know, I, I tried to inject so the, the humor that I could try to find, that was maybe, I think I tried to should I have a dry sense of humor, like, or wry. I mean, cause someone, you know, it, she's had, a, it's a lot. Um, but I don't know if the scripts really gave her the space to, to loosen up really much. Yeah, and that sense of humor is very dry, but it's also very observational. She's very quick to pick up on on things around her. Um, and then if you take a step back, like when she's at the wedding, she, you know, she's kind of the person that is quite comfortable standing on the edge, just watching everything that's going on a lot. And did you want to very intentionally create her as a character who is very astute in the way that she watches people and the way that she can pick up on certain things in such an instant? I didn't do that intentionally, no, but I, it's that's nice if that's something that's coming up. I... I I, it's interesting you say it because I do think people that don't trust people 
need to suss them up pretty quickly. You know, you need to become adept at reading the room, especially if you're just not sort of easygoing and in and, and life's good been good to you all the time. So that would make sense, actually, that that it would fit with the like psychological profile of the character. Yeah. And when it comes to her relationship with her son and a lot of the choices that she starts to make throughout the series, it's not surprising that these are the choices that she makes because of the dynamic that we've seen within that relationship already. And even though Virgil is around, it, I get the impression watching it that he's someone who, you know, shows up when the times are good and, and isn't there at, at, at the hard times a lot of the, the time. So for all sense and purposes, she is a single parent probably 70% of the time. And that yeah. also creates a really unique intimacy between parents and children as well when it's just the two of them and there's nobody else as part of that nuclear family unit and so what did you want that unique space of intimacy to be with her relationship with her son so that when she makes these choices it's not at all surprising to see the the route she takes we wanted to make it well you know it, it is a codependent relationship um and i think she's trying her very best do I think it's the healthiest <laughs> mother-son relationship I've ever seen? No. I mean, for many reasons, I think she's protecting him. Well, she coddles him a little bit because I think there's guilt there. But I don't know if that's really going to help someone in life. And also to so fiercely protect him from consequences that he may, you know, or may not deserve. deserve um is that the best thing to do for someone? You know, so I think, I don't think it's the healthiest relationship. And I think also he's a man, not, you know, he's not a boy. And they live together in this trailer. It's a, a little bit off, you know, but she loves him. I mean, that is the driving force of her life is her love for her kid. Um, could she maybe be handling it in a better way, perhaps? And she does have that incredibly steadfast, immediate support of his innocence throughout. But also it's interesting that they wrote in, you know, the the instance where he does get into that fight and she is aware of the violence that he's capable of when pushed into a certain situation. Um, and, and so how did you want her to process taking in that information? And again, just kind of like putting her walls up of like, I can't necessarily process this and acknowledge this still. I don't, she doesn't. Yeah. I think it's like, he didn't do it. He wasn't there, that didn't happen. She doesn't, I, I don't think, I think it doesn't enter her mind for one second that he could kill someone or even what, you know, what we see that he did do, that he's a violent, you know, he's disenfranchised too, you know. Um, but I think it's interesting in the, the scene, I don't know if you guys have seen it yet. I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to say or not, but um, there's a scene where she sits him down and says, what kind of trouble are you in? And the way the question is asked isn't, I want to know the truth. It's more like, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> do, do you know, like, tell them what, what's going on? Because how do we maneuver it? I don't think I was asking the question to say, tell me the truth. So we can deal with it. It was like, how deep are we in? You know, who, what happened? How bad is it? And one of the other aspects with her as a character is is the setting of her workplace and the fact that she is in a leadership role within that in terms of trying to form a union. And I thought it was an interesting approach that she very much is someone who is is having conversations with people, swaying them to sign on. And at the same time, she doesn't create that leadership by being the loudest person in the room and by being the most vivacious in the middle of a group conversation. It's very much about the intimacy of, of connection. Um, and so how did you want to set about figuring out what that dynamic was going to be amongst her colleagues in that way um that was uh the hardest part of the show for me um motivating that <clears throat> um and as you say because she's not that person she's not that person um and i think um i think ultimately what it's about is or what drives it is agency like she has no control over so much in her life. You know, she has no control over her home 
because her husband won't give her any money and it gets foreclosed upon, you know, like he helps out. But I mean, like she, she's, she has no control of anything and even working her hardest. So I think trying to establish a union is also about just trying to establish some sense of agency for her, something that she can have some power and control in. So I don't think it was about having big speeches and having a big personality. I think it was about a gritty sort of determination to like bend something, you know, so that she had some, you know, power. And she's also a character, you know, we were touching upon it earlier that she's dealing with a lot of pain management and through the work that she does, that does, there's that description of how she wakes up every single night with pain shooting up her arms, like she can't move her hands and her fingers properly, which is how she makes a living as well. Um, and so how did that influence a lot of the detailing in your performance in just having that constant awareness of, okay, you know, maybe her hand's going to move in this way because of the pain that she's dealing with and the way that her muscles have been affected and, and even just what that does to you to be woken up in the night by constant pain every single yeah. day as well. I didn't, I didn't lean into that too hard. I mean, I, I, I felt that she talks about our hands a lot in the script, which I, I thought we sort of got it, you know. Um, and because it's discussed so much, I didn't think like, because <laughs> you going to hell my performance. <laughs> it's just, I don't have arthritis. Like, you know, it, so I, 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 I thought a lot about it. And I mean, I, you know, you can do subtle things, but I mean, it, my hands do work. So I think pretending for nine episodes that they don't didn't, I just didn't, I didn't, I wasn't keen on that. I don't know why. Cause it's, there's so much more interesting parts to her personality than that her hands hurt, you know? And also they, they, they look normal, they, they're not arthritic. So unless we wanted to go down that whole route with the prosthetic and stuff like that, I, it felt limiting to me in a way that, um, uh, I was, I, I, I think it was a light touch. That's a long way of saying, it's just light touch. Yeah. And a lot of the external production designs and costume design elements also tell so much story about your character, whether it's the clothing that she's wearing that just feels incredibly lived in. And like, you know, these are the clothes that she's probably been wearing for the last five, 10 years, day in, day out. Um, and even the the production design details around the home as well that that have that sense of they've been in this home for so long and, and gives you little inflections and details about this family as well. And so how did those external components help in terms of you know, adding layers or determining certain details within her as a character? I think, um, well, I would say, I don't know, I, this might not be answering your question directly, but I felt like the trailer, the interior of the trailer was very informative that way because I thought it was kind of nice, you know, like it was, I mean, it's all, it's a, maybe a two feet bigger than an actual double wide. It's, it's, it's a little bit exaggerated for, for to put the cameras in. But it's a nice, it's a nice place to live, and I felt a lot of affection for it, like the way set deck, you know, decorated it, and it, it just felt like, oh, this is a home to be proud of. Like, you know, she says it's a piece of shit, now, which is funny, but I mean, it's like, does does the stove work? You know, it's like it's like I would think about the things in that trailer and think, how is that impacting her life? Does it does do three of the burners not work? What you know, what what. And think about the proximity of like her, his bedroom is like right next to her bedroom. And how are they living like that? You know, like that's really intimate. Like, so I feel like being on that set was perhaps most informative over the wardrobe. And given that there were such a multitude of different really unique challenges, both in terms of what this character is asking from you and even going back to shooting all of the multitude of episodes at once, what do you feel are, are the biggest things that you've come out of working on this series, having learned about your own craft and performance as an actor? Hmm. I did have to adjust the way I work a little bit um because there was a a real stress on the dialogue being word perfect 
which there isn't always. Some writers like that. Some writers do not like that. I mean, Adam's playwright. I, you know, I think that's there's a different level of, you know, if you're acting it and I'm getting the gist, it's okay. Or I, you need to have every single solitary line. I'm used to working in a sort of looser fashion, or certainly on the affair. You know, um, uh, so, and I don't like to over prepare because I've done this job for many, 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 many years. And some of, one of the things that gives me, I feel spontaneity and a, a space to breathe is to not be like over bogged down in, you know, preparation. Cause it, it's, it's just, it's just more exciting that way, you know? And it's harder to take a note, I think, when you're, you know, so dug in deep to the page. So, but the writers like that. They wanted it said exactly how they had written it. And so I had to adjust adjust to that because that's what they wanted. So it was a little bit more nerd work is, is what my friend calls it, which is a good point. It's like, you just got to do the nerd work and then you're going to be, you know, it's, it's boring, but do it. So that that was different. So I don't know if I learned anything different about my craft, but I did have to get a little more rigorous or uh, uptight <laughs> than I usually am. I'm always, I try to be rigorous all the time. Well, I'm, I'm so excited to see where this trajectory continues going for her character, for your character. I don't imagine things are going to go that well for her, but it'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, um, hopefully it will be interesting to watch. I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for taking time to have this conversation today, Maura. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Have a great day.